Who's feeling warmer today than they did yesterday? Yes. For one, big round of applause to Leslie. She solved it. Again. Second quick announcement. Uh, the blankets that we brought in yesterday, as we do not need them, um, are going to be, Get is providing five free taxis for us to kind of load those up and send them off to center point uh, to keep the homeless warm. So you can feel free to keep yours, but we will judge you um, for doing that. So just think that through. Um, and if you do have your blanket and you'd like to do that, you can find a spot for them in the, in the session hall back there. I'm sure that they'll, uh, it'll be well marked. Um, uh, in the meantime, let's go to our next panelist. Please welcome to the stage, Professor Jackie Hunter of Benevolent Bio and our moderator, Sarah Burr. Hey, thanks for joining us. It's a real pleasure to be here, Sarah. Yeah, so uh, we've heard a lot about artificial intelligence over the course of this conference, but when you add medicine, that's a whole other component. Yep. And your company has raised $100 million to do drug discovery using AI. Yeah. Why are you worth $100 million? What are you doing? Um, well, AI is, is going to be transformational to drug discovery and development. One of the reasons that we focused on drug discovery and development, although our technology could be used in many different other verticals, is that there's a huge need. First of all, there's a huge biological need. Some of the really urgent issues for society, like dementia, which is the leading cause of death in the UK now, or antimicrobial resistance, where the bacteria that cause things like tuberculosis, um, sepsis, bronchitis, they are becoming resistant to the bacterial agents we use to treat them. And if we don't solve that, medicine will be going back into the dark ages. Women will die in childbirth. You won't have transplants. People with chronic immune deficiency disorders like cystic fibrosis will, will die. And so it's a huge issue. But moreover, I come from the pharmaceutical industry. And basically, the R&D process, even though we now have so much more data, just hasn't changed in decades. It costs over $2 billion dollars now to develop a medicine because it includes all the cost of failures. Many people who work in the industry never actually work on a drug that makes it to the market. And uh, that, that just is not sustainable. So we have to look at doing things differently. And what really excites me about Benevolent is we've got the chance to really transform and disrupt the drug dis discovery and development process, uh, being more efficient and more successful which means we'll be able to deliver more medicines to patients and <clears throat> hopefully you know, uh, solve some of these issues. Right, and you mentioned uh, antibiotic resistance. That's a yeah. huge one. Your company has mentioned they're working on the gamut of a whole bunch of different drugs, that, uh, or discovery of drugs that yeah. might. But the, the way you're working on it is uh, by going through scientific papers. Yeah. And can you explain that process a little bit? Well, <clears throat> the amount of data of scientific data in life sciences in particular has just exploded over the last few decades. And you have over 10,000 new papers over uploaded every uh, day to PubMed. You have uh, a new um, scientific paper published in life sciences every 30 seconds. So no one scientist, even if they just did nothing but read papers for the rest of their lives, could actually absorb all that information. And the other real problem is it's messy data. Most of it's unstructured data. It's not nice and uniform. And so what we're using AI and machine learning to do is to really tackle that problem of unstructured data using our systems, using cutting edge algorithms to pull together that data, present it to our scientists in ways that enable them to be able to use their insight to look at the most relevant pieces of information and then come up with meaningful hypotheses for treating serious diseases. Are you only using scientific papers? 
We use a range of data sources. Some, uh, most of them are publicly available. We pay to have access to some proprietary data sources, like, for example, patent databases. And we use structured data as well. So, for example, OMIM and other genomic structured data. Basically. Okay, so you're also using genomics, you're using a bunch of different data sources. Yeah. That yeah. wasn't yeah. clear before, because mostly what I've read is that you're using these scientific journals. Yeah. Okay. And we hope as we build our own pipeline, I mean, the thing that's unique for us as a company is we're actually not selling this as a service. We are using it to develop our own pipeline of clinical candidates, drugs in the clinic with patients. And of course, as we do that, we'll generate more data that we can use to train our systems and learn more about our patients and better stratify them for clinical trials. Mm -hmm. and, and Benevolent Bio came out of Benevolent AI. Yeah. But can you explain the structure and how much of that 100 million goes towards the bio portion? At the moment, the main aim, we, Benevolent is the holding company. And the reason we have a holding company is we believe in the power of what we're doing that we'll be able to move into other verticals in the near future. But we don't want to spread ourselves too thin and we want to really demonstrate the power of the technology in our first vertical, which is healthcare. Um, so we have a, a tech arm that's headed by Jerome Presenti, who's uh, the ex-head of IBM's artificial intelligence, and a bio arm that I run. Uh, so our tech is really devoted to our uh, drug discovery and development, but we have this flexibility in the structure both within bio to move into other verticals and with the holding company to move into other, other verticals. Yeah. So the lion's share of the 100 million is mostly for the bio Absolutely portion? Absolutely, at the moment, yeah. Yeah, at the moment, okay. So, uh, all right. And you mentioned uh, other, you know, DeepMind, IBM, Watson. What do you, what do you think of these other AI structures that are also looking in medicine, also looking at with huge data sets? I mean, I think their approach is at the moment very different. They're focusing much more on large clinical data sets and impacting on healthcare. So for example, DeepMind, as you know, has recently done a couple of deals with Moorfields and, and UCL. Um, and the Royal uh, so they are um, really looking at the kind of patient outcomes end of the spectrum and not focusing on the early drug discovery and development. Uh, and, and also trying to develop technologies that are more generically applied within the healthcare space. I think our, one of our unique selling points is that we are really focused end to end on drug discovery and development and the application of artificial intelligence all the way through that process. Would you say that they are competitors or companions? I think they're companions rather than competitors. I think we're operating in a very different space. Um, ultimately, the healthcare space is so huge that there are you know, en enormous potential for a number of different providers and, and companies. But um, you know, we've had some independent verification that we are the only a applied AI company that's really building our own clinical pipeline at using AI and machine learning. What's the, what's the end goal here with, with, with doing something like that? The end goal is really, for me, twofold. Firstly, I want to show that by doing things differently, by really effectively mining that corpus of information, taking it to really experienced drug discovery scientists, we can pick better targets to work on and be more successful in the clinic. And I can give you an example where we've already demonstrated um, identifying um, targets. One of the areas we try to work on is say, let's take drugs that are sitting on the shelf in pharma companies and see whether we can find a new use for them. And so we um, looked at motor neuron disease. I don't know if you know about motor neuron disease, but it's a terrible disease. Um, your motor nerves die, so you become gradually paralyzed. Within two to five years, you're dead, and it usually strikes people you know, between 20 and 40. And they can be younger and older, but you know, people in the prime of life, it's, I've seen somebody die with it, it's a horrible disease. So what we did was we used our technology to mine our corpus of information to identify and surface within one week a top 200 hypotheses. These were then presented to our scientists who refined them, really interrogated them using their insight and knowledge. And eventually we whittled it down to the top five compounds we wanted to test 
we went to a, a group in Sheffield who are world leaders in this area, and they tested them in essentially a, a, a test tube preparation using um, cells cloned from patients' own cells. Um, so we were able to look at this assay. One compound didn't work of the five. Two worked as well as, gold, as the gold standard, uh, Rilizol, which is used in patients but doesn't produce a lot of benefit. And two worked much, much better. They were the best thing that uh, I'd ever seen. But and importantly, these were not um, four of those uh, five uh, compounds were, were things that these researchers had never thought to look at. One was actually one they'd been working up and uh, arrived at after about 10 years of work. So and, and it's because of your technology you were yeah, able to do this really faster. It really accelerated the process yeah. and actually came out with better results. How do you, so it sounds like you're making some progress, but in all of these data sets and everything that you're looking at, how do you ensure that the preliminary data you're looking at is correct in the first place so that you think you have something Right? You think you actually have something, and then you don't proceed years down the road on you know, information that may be incorrect. There's a lot of, and I'm saying this because there's a lot of you know, scientific journals that oh, might uh, have uh, absolutely. unreproducible material. Yeah. Reproducibility, and, and the other thing that I'm very keen on is making sure that we get negative data, because what, quite often it's hard to find those publications of negative data that can disprove your hypothesis. Hmm. This is why you, you need to have a really experienced and high quality team of drug discoverers and developers, because they are able to look at the data, we know the provenance of the data, they can interrogate it, and they make a, a, a subsequent value judgment. So we look at the corpus of data, we triage it and rank it, but we have a sanity check with our scientists. So it, this is why we are augmenting the insight of the scientists, not replacing the insight of the scientists. Oh, okay, interesting. Now there's a lot of talk about automation and robots, so we're, we're not gonna make the robots become our scientists? No. Anytime soon? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, how soon are we going to see a promising new drug come out of Benevolent? Well, we, we've actually recently licensed some um, uh, clinical candidates, clinical assets, drugs to be in the clinic from Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and uh, we will be putting one of those into the clinic next year. So it's a clinical trial, though, to be clear. It's not yes. a, it's not a well, for we, consumer. Well, we've got some surrogates for success, like, the, for example, the, the ALS example I mentioned. Um, we will be... Uh, talking more about other examples that we've got. But of course, we don't want to talk about them in detail until we've actually patented them so that we can then uh, follow up on them. Sure, that, uh, but going on that, take us five years down the road yeah. at Benevolent. Uh, what breakthroughs do you think we're going to be benefiting from? I think we will see, I, I fervently believe that we will see something of benefit for ALS. I believe that some of the other disorders that we're working on will make a difference to patients' lives with Parkinson's disease, potentially Alzheimer's disease. And I'd like us, although we're not working on it at the moment, to work um, towards having some impact on the antimicrobial resistance agenda. What's the one thing you would choose if you could only have one breakthrough? If I could only have one breakthrough, it would be for motor neuron disease because it's a it's a devastating disease that affects not just the patients, but also their carers. Mm -hmm. And, and, and how, many, how many people are affected by that? Uh, in the UK at the moment, I think it's about 200,000 people. Okay, so it's small, but it's very devastating. Yes, it exactly. I mean, and we've oh. tried to focus on diseases that have higher me medical need. Um, and because we are a, a smaller company, we can you know, look at those orphan diseases and be able to, to really work well not only with our technology, but I also believe it's really important to work with patient groups as well. Uh, so we've, we know, have a, a lot of collaborations with uh, patient groups and um, interactions with patient groups. Okay, and it, it also looks like you may have had a lucrative deal with uh, in at Parkinson's disease as well. Well, we had a, a deal uh, in 2014 with uh, some Alzheimer's. We partnered with a company on, uh, we identify a couple of promising targets in Alzheimer's disease, which uh, we're taking forward in you know, collaboration with the company. Yeah, okay. Um, something I think is really interesting about you is that you went from, you took a leap from academia yeah. into a startup. Yeah. What made you do that? Because it was incredibly exciting. And I, my background was originally in the pharma industry, then I went into academia, and 
And, and for me, the chance to actually really change how the pharma industry develops and distributes drugs. And actually, more broadly, this technology will change how we do research and development in a number of other industries was just something, it was too good an opportunity to miss. I had a great job at the BBSRC, you know, sort of um, funding £500 million worth of investment in UK bioscience, but I'm afraid that the, uh, the lure of benevolent was just too great because this is a real opportunity and a timely opportunity because it's now is where it's a perfect sort of coming together of the comp computing power the data analytics and storage and the insight and the need are all coming together to create the perfect wave of innovation that I hope will really change the industry. Yeah, and you're not seeing that happen in academia per se, you're seeing it in the startup and the tech world? I, th I think that um, we collaborate with academia uh, and I think the, the, the real innovation happens and the translation can happen with people who have experience of not just the basic drug, uh, discovery of new uh, biological facts but also being able to translate them and make important medicines and I wouldn't underestimate the fact that we have within our, our company some of the people who have taken and developed medicines and brought them to uh, the market when you think that less than 5% of all the medicines that go into the clinic actually make it to the market. That's a really experienced team. Yeah, and you believe that what you're working on is going to increase that by how, how many I mean, percentage points? I mean, it's, it's hard to quantify, but I'll be disappointed if we don't sort of increase our success rate by fourfold, yeah, okay. which if you think about it, is pretty amazing for the industry. Yeah. And already, you, um, I was a non-exec director of our founder's previous company, and it took him took Proximogen, that company, 10 years to develop a, a clinical pipeline of, with some, a phase two and phase one assets. Uh, and we've pretty much got the same pipeline within a year, so. Yeah, you're, you're not very, I mean, you, Bio came out this last year, and then, and then Benevolent AI is what, like? Well, but, yeah. uh, um, Stratify was formed at the end of 2013, right. yeah. and um, Benevolent was formed at the beginning of this year. Yeah, so it's stratified and medical, and then it became benevolent yes. AI. And, and I think the, that it shows the evolving of our thinking because we realized that the technology could move beyond medical, that it could move into veterinary, it could move into nutraceutical, but then beyond that into other verticals as well. So we've talked about AI, but I kind of want to shift this a little bit. Um, what do you think is the most promising technological development of new drugs beyond AI? What are you most excited about beyond AI? I think um, in terms of new drugs, some of the new delivery technologies, being able to deliver proteins uh, much more effectively orally, there's some very exciting developments there. So people don't have to have injections, they could have uh, oral delivery. I think the uh, power of really deeply uh, using AI as well, but, but another term, but being able to really interrogate the human genome and look for variations that predict responses to drugs. I think very s there are some simple things we can do in terms of uh, in increasing compliance. 50% of people don't take their medicines. How, I mean, but how, how would you So there about are companies like Affectiva that are looking at visual recognition um, where you can actually record people taking their medicines. <laughs> There's a crowdfunding robot that I saw the other week that helps you kind of remind you to take your medicine and takes a picture of you taking your medicine. There's, there's some really smart. I don't innovation. know that I want a robot telling me to take my medicine, but uh, I mean, I th <laughs> yeah. So, the, but I think this, uh, and also the real power of um, imaging. Mm -hmm. We've been able to image cells and dynamic processes in cells, and that will tell us a lot more about how a system works, how systems biology, how that works, how your body works, and more importantly, perhaps, how your brain works. Oh. What do you think of CRISPR? I think CRISPR is a really exciting technology, and I think it opens the possibility um, downstream therapeutically, but the initial application uh, will be to be able to validate 
it's much more quickly. So, for example, with benevolent, if we came up with some new targets and there were no drugs for that target, that protein in the body, we could actually use CRISPR to knock it out and see whether it had effect on the biological system we were interested in. So, in the same way as the advances that have happened in stem cells, uh, people were very excited, oh, you could transplant neurons and save your brain. But actually, the real advance has been, for, for example, with ALS, being able to take patient skin cells, culture them back into neurons, and actually show that you get the same cell death that you get in the disease, and then we can use it to screen drugs. So it's, it's, it's an amazing time to be working in biomedicine. It really is. You've got, I mean, if you could combine artificial intelligence, CRISPR, and all sorts of new technological advances, I mean, it's, it's a very exciting time. Yeah, and, and, and we, we need it because uh, one of the greatest challenges in the 20th century, we have an aging population. Mm -hmm. We want the population to age well. At the moment, we have an aging population that isn't aging as well as it could be. Mm -hmm. And then there are the other challenges of, um, as I say, antimicrobial resistance. But there are a number of dis really nasty diseases like Huntington's disease and a lot of childhood diseases where I think we could make some real progress with these new technologies. Oh. Jackie, thank you so much for coming on stage with us. You've been lovely. Oh, and thank you for, thank you for asking me. It's been yeah. really great. And I'm no longer afraid to get old, so thank you.